All right. Hello, everyone out there on uh, Facebook Live and on YouTube. If you're watching this after the uh, the conversation is over, we'd still love that you will like our channel About Time Project on Facebook and also on uh, Facebook as well as on YouTube. We really would appreciate that if you would give us shares and if you would give us a like and subscribe to us on Facebook as well as YouTube. I am joined today in conversation with Janice Boynton over here on my left, I guess that's there for her, uh, all the way in Old Town, Maine in the East Coast. And I'm in Salinas, California on the, uh, on the West Coast with my cat, Hamilton, who's looking out the window at a bird, probably at the bird feeder. Life is really great over here. Anyway, <laughs> this has been really interesting. Janice and I have been doing a long conversation about facilitated communication and uh, rapid prompting method. We will be using shortcuts like FC and RPM at times because Janice and I, um, those are acronyms that are commonly used for facilitated communication and rapid prompting method. We are joined in conversation with Craig Foster, who's a very good friend of ours. We just absolutely adore him. He's in his brand new office in Syracuse-ish area, New York. He's just moved there, which is why he doesn't have any art on his walls. And he has boxes he's shown us on the floor that need to be unpacked. And he's sick and tired of, of moving but I just love the green color it looks great with your shirt you coordinated well today Craig thank you for making an effort <laughs> I really appreciate it um, we will be doing a hour ish maybe a little longer than that which just zooms by as as they say on zoom and we're going to be talking mainly about the documentary Deej and that is spelled D-E-E-J. And um, we're talking to Craig Foster about this because he's a behavioral uh, psychiatrist, psychologist. It's like, what is your thing? <laughs> well, what I was in the behavioral sciences and leadership department, but uh, my specific discipline is social psychology. So social I'm psychology. Social psychologist. Okay. He's done a lot of research on this documentary and the pseudoscience and the science behind or lack thereof science of this <clears throat> afterwards and we will be talking to him mostly about um not only about the documentary but about things around behind it and, and so on it's going to be an interesting discussion i think it's going to get a little heated because we all agree but it is one of these passionate things topics that we all three are probably going to get um, anyway, if you've been following this series, I think you guys will see the frustration in, in, in us uh, about um, how this still is passed off. So if you have questions in the um, chat on Facebook, I can see, as I tell you, I can see about the last five uh, co um, comments. So if I don't like your comment, um, that means I probably didn't see it and I'm probably not going to say anything. Um, so you might have to post it again and we'll be happy to stop and, and take your questions as we go. And uh, I'm going to lead this off by, pass this off over to Janice, who will give us a quick little pop up on what is Facebook, I mean, uh, facilitated communication and rapid prompting method. And then Craig will kind of tell us a little bit about Deej and what's going on with that. Okay. And then we'll move on. So facilitated communication is um, a communication technique that it's purportedly works with people with severe communication difficulties and the, the, the premise behind it is that you simply provide physical and emotional support and that allows um, the person with disabilities to type on a some sort of device or point to a, a keyboard or a letter board or whatever and, and, and unlock their hidden intelligences. And as we've talked about in the past, um, there's, there's various types. There's traditional traditional facilitated communication which is um, physical contact at the wrist or elbow um, while the people are typing um, the rapid prompting method for for the purpose of these talks is a, a facilitator holds the board in the air while the person with disabilities points to the board and then there's eye tracking which also it's sort of a hybrid where um, the facilitators hold a, a board in the air and supposedly by by watching where the person with disabilities is looking they can they can tell what letters they're talking about so we've we have 
done an extensive inter um, a discussion about those in past videos. So if you um, check the um, About Time Project YouTube channel, you'll be able to find those discussions. We're not going to get into the the technique that much today, um, but just wanted to give you a uh, a general view, um, overview of what FC is and RPM. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why we're talking about Deej today, the movie Deej, is that it's a um, it's a movie that has just been um, it's streaming now on on PBS Public Broadcasting System, and um, it features a, a young man named DJ Severis who's using, um, for all intents and, pur and purposes, he's using facilitated communication, and um, Craig. Um, one of the reasons why we asked Craig to come join us for this discussion was that he uh, last was it last year I think in 2019 wrote mm -hmm. an article called Deja Vu, Deja Vu documentary revisits facilitated communication pseudoscience so um, we want to get into the discussion um, kind of pick his brain about what he thought about the movie in terms of um, science versus pseudoscience and um, maybe have, a, have him explain some of the issues that surround the movie in terms of the, the cultural and the, the scientific and psychological, um, what? Um, issues that, uh, yeah. yeah, that's what not? So I'm gonna throw it over to Craig. Uh, well, thanks. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was an interesting, documentary to watch. I had to brace myself before I uh, <laughs> watched it. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was really interesting. I, so, I mean, I guess a little about me, I'm a social psychologist. Um, I'm a, a professor and uh, currently chair of the psychology department at SUNY Cortland, which is just south of me here in New York. And one of the main things I study as a psychologist is the development of pseudoscientific beliefs. And this is what led me to FC and then eventually led me to reviewing the documentary and writing a little bit about it. And the thing uh, in that context, the thing that struck me the most about the documentary is that at heart, it's the theme is really very old. Um, it, uh, what surprises me the most is that the documentary really doesn't offer anything new. It's, um, that saying old wine in, in new bottles. And I didn't know what to expect when I watched it. I feel like I attempted to watch it with an open mind, uh, as one should, but it's just the same old story. And that's why I titled the paper the way I did, is I really wanted people to understand that this story has been told over and over again for um, well over 40 years now, um, I, really the, the um, response to it is younger than that, but it's, it's just an old story, and that's what struck me the most. We should say um, that I didn't, for people who are new, I think people that have been following us will know what I, I'm going to say next, but the people <laughs> that may be new, um, the, the problem with facilitated communication is that it has been studied um, and in controlled settings, it's, it's shown every single time that it's the facilitator and not the person with disabilities doing mm -hmm. the communication. So um, that's, that's part of what Craig is talking about in terms of whether it's new or not. And um, I know that the, the term pseudoscience comes up quite a bit when, when in the, it, particularly in the critic literature, the skeptical community, looks at FC and they say, oh, that's pseudoscience. But um, I'm wondering, Craig, if you could kind of give us an, an idea of, um, I know in some of the things that you've written about, you've talked about like supported science, disputed science, mm -hmm. pseudoscience, like how do, we, how do we know the difference between those three things? Well, I think the distinctions are, uh, if we're honest, the distinctions at some point, they're, they're murky. Uh, it's, it's well known among philosophers and psychologists and, and anybody else that's well versed in the idea of pseudoscience that as much as we would like uh, what a, uh, a philosopher that I really, really admire, um, 
named uh, Pigliucci, Massimo Pigliucci. And he and his colleagues have done a really nice job of saying, there's no silver bullet that identifies pseudoscience. So if you're looking for that one thing that you can point to and say, that's always in science and not in pseudoscience or vice versa, you're not going to find it. But just because a distinction is fuzzy, it doesn't mean it isn't real. And so the example I typically will go to in class is I will say, uh, the distinction between what's a sport and what isn't a sport is murky, but it doesn't mean it isn't real. If I ask people, is basketball a sport? They're almost all going to say, well, of course it's a sport. And if I say, is knitting a sport? They're going to probably say, no, um, knitting is not a sport. And if I say something like, um, I don't know, synchronized swimming, like you might get disagreement. If you said darts, you might get disagreement. So just because it's fudgy doesn't mean it isn't real. I think at this point, it's probably thoughtful to ask yourself, is using the term pseudoscience even productive? And in a way, I don't really like the term because it, it isn't a very friendly term. And I can definitely sympathize that people who um, believe in something, when they hear it called pseudoscientific, they understandably get pretty defensive. But there's an argument to be fa uh, argument to be put forth in favor of using the term, and that is when you have claims that honestly they just they don't really have any justification. There's an argument to be made that you have to call it what it is. Facilitated communication, where it is right now. I, I don't think it is safe or ethical to give it a maybe. It's pseudoscience. It's not a new, it's yeah, not a new yeah. theory that's debated. If if people that support facilitated communication claim want it to be considered something better than pseudoscience, they have to deliver some evidence that is just frankly better than some of the old arguments that we've heard and we've addressed. And, and so if I might just ramble on a little bit, one of the things that I've learned examining, okay, my cat is now clawing at the door. I, That's I okay, go let, her, go let the yeah. cat in. No, I have to let the cat out. Oh, oh, oh. They're always on the wrong side of the door. Yeah, yeah they don't believe in doors and I, I agree. I wish we didn't have, I want to live in a world where we don't have to have doors. Go, go, there we go. All right, <laughs> he, he changed his mind. Okay, so I'm he back. He wants to stay? So, no, he wanted out, but he'll, you know how cats are. He'll want back in in, in a minute or two. <laughs> but uh, oh, You guys are great. I love talking to you. <laughs> one thing. Uh, Real human thing beings that, here. Yeah. <laughs> And my, my door is windowed, so my son just went by, and I half expected him to come in and go like, you know, your face or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the interview is still early. Um, I think one thing that studying pseudoscience has taught me is humans are just, they are decent at scientific reasoning, but they're not perfect at it. And that's why people can get sucked into the vortex of pseudoscience. Pseudoscience survives because a community makes arguments that appeal to people psychologically, even though those arguments fail scientifically. So experts can look at them and say, this is what's wrong with these four arguments that you're making, but within the community that supports it, those arguments are good enough to just sort of keep hope alive and keep them going. And one thing I've learned in teaching this material and researching it myself, it, it's something we all sort of know, but what really has been highlighted for me is the first thing that you need to do is just identify what the claim is and not. And when people are losing an argument, what they will often do is they will just talk about something else. So you start debating the claim and then somebody gets defensive and they go like, oh yeah, well you're a jerk. And you're like, okay, I, that could be true, but that isn't a scientific <laughs> argument, right? That is just you disengaging. Or you can even see people that unknowingly, like they're just uncomfortable and then they'll say like, man, I could use a cheeseburger. And then they, they just disengage. And that's fine. Nobody needs to discuss facilitated communication all day and all night. But it is helpful to say, what is the claim? And with facilitated communication, I think what you really see is, and I'm, I'm so glad Janice outlined this, 
the claim is that facilitated communication will help um, uh, people with complex communication needs communicate more effectively. That's what started this in the 1970s. That's what's kept it alive since that time. The whole problem is really very simple, and that is the development of an alternate explanation called facilitator influence. And when you sift through how these two claims exist, facilitator influence doesn't necessarily, um, it isn't mutually exclusive with the idea of genuine facilitated communication. And so that's important because here's what happens, like in the, in the most cursory review of facilitated communication that I know many people will know already, so I won't go into it, but facilitated communication boomed with just this idea of introducing it to people. And then they, some of them start to communicate better. And the assumption is, wow, all the, look, it worked. And the problem is that because of the growth of FC and the subsequent testing that people have done and additional research outside of the uh, facilitated communication issue, the idea of facilitator influence was, was carefully established. Like even facilitated communication supporters, I don't think can deny that um, facilitator influence exists. All those studies that were done, the like early studies by Wheeler and Mostert and other important people in this, in this field, all of them demonstrate convincingly that you can, that facilitators can unknowingly influence the facilitated communication process. I mean, to the point where people like Dan Wagner, who is a, was a remarkable social psychologist and very sadly passed away, um, you know, relatively early, they can bring in undergraduates and train them and, and put them in conditions where there's no way that facilitated communication can occur because the person they're facilitating isn't even getting information, right? And they don't know it and they think they've engaged in facilitated communication. So, uh, <laughs> yes, please. Dan, uh, I'm just going to clarify. Dan um, Wagner wrote an article called um, Clever Hands um, mm -hmm. Influ Intel, um, Intel uh, what is it? Un uncontrolled intelligences and facilitated communication, something like that. And, mm -hmm. and um, what he did in those tests that you're talking about is that he, he figured out that just, just by believing that FC could work, it would work. Mm -hmm. you know, so if, you, if you had, you didn't have to be a fanatic, but if you, um, if you believed that it could work and the, the, the person you were working with could be influencing the, the communications and not you as the facilitator, then the chances are that it would increase the odds that it would actually it would actually like work. the Ouija board. Yes, yeah. it, that's absolutely true. It was a very careful five study paper, and he's not alone. Um, I think a woman named Burgess uh, wrote one before him, where they trained novices in the FC. And um, <laughs> as I recall, even the skeptics or the people who were doubtful, I should say, of FC even they attributed, generally attributed some of the, uh, their, uh, success, their success to FC. But he did clearly demonstrate that people that were led to believe in facilitated communication were more amenable to believing that they were engaging in it successfully. We don't even really need those studies. I mean, we're glad to have them. They fill in the picture. But the sheer number of studies where supposedly successful FC pairs suddenly failed when facilitators were screened from the critical information that they needed to pass on. All of those studies demonstrate that those pairs that were supposedly successful were really, uh, the success was generated by facilitator influence. That's the only way to explain the sudden inability to engage in successful facilitated communication when the person with complex communication needs can see a photo and the person who's facilitating can't particularly when what answer is given is the answer the facilitator has seen, not the, um, and not the person with complex communication needs. So all this to say, make it really simple. You have two claims, facilitated communication works, facilitator influence is a real thing. Nobody can debate whether facilitator uh, influence is a real thing. It's been established so many times and we, and, 
those of us who played with the Ouija board and scared ourselves as kids, right? We, <laughs> uh, unless some demon actually controlled that tablet, right? We, we, we all know that this can happen. It's the same thing that happens in dowsing where people walk around, they think they can find water and you put them in a controlled setting and they don't know which tube the water is coming through and all of a sudden they perform at chance levels. Mm -hmm. They've so, never tested themselves. Well, I mean, you know, or they quit doing it not long after they uh, they suddenly found that they weren't really successful. Or psychics who say that, you know, I I can't do it on the Johnny Carson show because it's just too stressful. And yeah, my abilities come and go. They, they when I'm they, successful, they, yeah. Pardon me. They say that about um, FC when they're testing FC two. The facilitators will start typing out. Um, oh, I'm really nervous, you know, and it's supposedly the the message from the person with disabilities that they're working with. All of a sudden, like before the before the testing, there were high fives and smiles everybody all around. Yep. And then as soon as the facilitator starts getting some awareness that that the testing might not be going the way they want it to, um, the the messages that come out on the typed board are oh that person's making me nervous and I don't like the the questions that are being asked and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it, that, that nervousness from the facilitator actually is transferred into the, the messages that come out on the. You know, I, that makes me think of, uh, you know, I used to play a lot of pool and I'd like to go into tournaments and play, you know, amateur -y kind of tournaments. I was never that great, but the, 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 you're playing in a tournament and you get these people who are like really into it and they'll start setting it up way in advance. They'll say, you know, that person over there wearing that really bright colored shirt is kind of distracting me. They're in my path and they'll start giving excuses of why this might fail. And so that whenever they do fail, they could say, well, it was because, you know, that person over there was walking by really and, and just, you know, it, it was that problem and, or the music was too loud or, or this or that. So they set it up so that there's already a fail in case they have to rely on it. So if this person is saying, facilitating, oh yeah, I'm really kind of, they're, they're uncomfortable with this, blah, blah, blah. Maybe they're also saying that because they feel that it's going to be a problem. And well, go ahead. It just that, that in cases, this case is like whenever the president says, I think we're going to have, we're going to see voter fraud everywhere. If you say that enough, people are going to say, well, maybe there was voter fraud or maybe it was a problem. Maybe they were uncomfortable. But like Jana said, before the test, we say, okay, do you have everything you need? Are you comfortable doing this at any time? If you'd like to get up during the test, what is it you said? They put an object on a shelf and they tell the person, if you want, if you remove that object from the shelf, that means it's the test is over. You don't have to give an explanation why just walk away. We will just walk well, away. Yeah. A lot of the, a lot of the, um, con the reputable controlled studies, they gave a, they give a, um, um, a, a, some sort of, clue to the person with disabilities that the facilitator doesn't know about to end the the session <laughs> anytime so they may just have to get up and pick up a cup off the shelf or whatever and and um that that never happens i mean they they don't they i wonder why don't, yeah use that but what, anyway. what is explain really quickly what is the reason because we get this all the time why don't they just set up a test and it would be so easy to test it's like what is going on what is it they tell you that you can't, what is the thing about the testing? Because as Craig says, this has been, dis, this has been dis explained 30, 40 years ago. We know what's going on. We know about the idiomotor effect. We know about facilitator influence. We know about all of these things. It would be done in, you know, a day if we could test, but what's going on there? Well, well think, about the, think about the nature of the claims and then it, it feeds into the psychology of the facilitators and what they're going through. And also the people that are supporters to the community. So the nature of the claim is that facilitated communication works and the alternate explanation is that it's facilitator influence. The existence of facilitator influence doesn't by definition mean that facilitated communication could never ever work. And I think that's what we, we I think that's what uh, many people overlook when they watch that frontline documentary and, and students will watch it and they'll go, oh, well, that's done. Surely there's no more facilitated communication. Mm -hmm. That's true. You never really die, right? And so why is that? Well, what happens then is um, this puts, if, if you just want to take the perspective of the facilitator, 
or people like Douglas Bicklin who have uh, promoted this idea or Rosemary Crossley. Okay. If we take a sympathetic view, that is a bitter, bitter pill to swallow. And we have to give them that space because mm -hmm. that's only fair. I mean, and when does this happen? This won't surprise any um, folk psychologist, which we all are. This really, really happens when you've invested deeply in a point of view, right? Most people, if you tell them that um, uh, original oatmeal is, is uh, you know, not as important or not as great as maple and brown sugar flavor, you know, they're like, I, okay, I, I, it's fine because we don't care. <laughs> But it's important to remember that facilitators, there. This is a viewpoint that is understandably central to their um, self-concept, or their. It's it's a, a salient and strong attitude because they've invested in it, and they've invested in it for reasons that, if you can back away from the discussion, they've invested it for reasons that we share. Right? They are nobody. I've never heard anybody say, man, I really want to get rich. I want to become a facilitator, right? <laughs> people, people become facilitators because as far as I can tell, they believe in it and they care about people mm -hmm. that have complex communication needs. That's admirable. But the problem is when they've invested that much, and you see the same thing with people who, uh, who promote anti-vaccination, right? It is so hard to look at the scientific evidence and say, you mean I'm promoting a practice that's actually harming the very people that I was trying to help? And I'm sorry, but to me, the answer is quite clearly yes to the experts and all the caring people that work with people with complex communication needs every day, right? The answer is yes, this is a dangerous practice. And so what happens then when you go through that, you are, this is going to be, um, uh, uh, you go through, it, it's uncomfortable to have that level of cognitive inconsistency. A lot of people are more familiar with the term cognitive dissonance. We can use that one if people want. But the behaviors and then the information, it, it, it's so inconsistent that it's, it's understandably uncomfortable. Well, what do you do then to resolve that inconsistency? Right? So as an outsider, you go, oh, this is easy. Chuck it in the garbage and do something else. But when you've invested that much, it's just too tempting to say, here's what's wrong with the test. And honestly, even in the moment, I can sympathize and understand with somebody having that reaction. The test is flawed. Right? I remember taking a test of verbal ability. I didn't score as high as I was like. I wouldn't say that I just aced the test. Right? And I'm like, oh, God, that test can't be right. I'm surely not going to get higher <laughs> than I am. But in time, you really, if you don't want to be fighting battle, losing battles over and over again, you, you do need, if you want to live up to your belief that you follow the evidence and you're evidence-based, you do in time need to give yourself the space to go, okay, maybe I can do something else. And for people who are facilitators or supportive of the facilitated communication community, there is a solution. There are other ways to help people who have complex communication needs that aren't FC, right? You can, you can do other things to help all those wonderful people. But I guess what I'm saying to summarize is I get it. I understand it. And I actually really appreciate the intent underneath it. But those of us that are passionate about the issue, that community and others need to understand that we critique not because we want to rain on parades or we want to hurt people. That part of it is, is decidedly unpleasant. Like mm -hmm. suggesting that that Deej might not have this incredible hidden intelligence that they suggested he has, that isn't fun. I don't want to say those things, but I feel morally bound to do it because FC has been clearly harmful to so many people. And I, I know this is hard for people to hear, and I, I get that, and I, I sympathize. But from my perspective, it's also harmful to Deej. Oh, so yeah. That's why, that's why you Where say are we an echo? things. It, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. But it, until the FC community, the, the test for FC is not hard. No, right I've, and it, I've been saying it, this. It, 
Yep, go ahead. I've, I've been saying this for a long time. These students, you watch them. Do you really think that these students want to be sitting in a chair in a classroom at, at a school? Do you think they really want to be going through college? Do you really think they want to have somebody sitting there next to them holding their hand this whole time? That, I mean, but that these is, people want to be themselves. And this is not, they're put into a, a persona of something that isn't them. They've taken oh, their totally voices agree. completely away from them. So they're not the the hot shot poet poet person going to college and 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 all the things that their parents may want them to be that's not them i'm sorry and absolutely like you said it is really heartbreaking to be the person saying you know sorry this isn't real you know and and you are harming him he could have probably had other ways of communicating do you really think this is what the life he wants going to conferences no i don't think so and we can't ask him because he's no. not communicating. And what well, you're saying is not, well, we're com he's communicating by saying, no, I am stressed, I don't wanna be here. You could, you could ask him if you had reliable information that Deej was communicating. And that test is easy to do, um, particularly in Deej's case. Deej was shown in the documentary having two facilitators, his mother and uh, an uh, unidentified person. Now, if Deej is comfortable with two facilitators, surely he could take a physics lesson with one and then have his mother, who would not attend the physics lesson and presuming she didn't have a, a knowledge of the material in the lesson already, which she very well might. But if it was specific information, it's an easy, easy test. And if you just show it and you show it reliably with a community of people that could say, yeah, I don't see any trickery here, right? we would eventually adapt our point of view. But that doesn't happen. The documentary only shows Deej succeeding under conditions that can be explained by facilitator influence. Then you get to the heart of what Janice introduced and why this debate goes on and on and on and why the distinction between science and pseudoscience is, is a murky one, but still very real. Because what happens then is the FC community develops a belief system that is not falsifiable. So they say, well, Deej can't do that because it's stressful when they're tested. This was Bicklin's response to those studies that showed facilitator yeah, yeah. right? He goes, well, the testing conditions could interfere with this. And then you have to sit back and say, well, what's reasonable? You are telling me that Deej can give a speech to the United Nations, but he can't learn a physics lesson with one facilitator sitting next to him, or no facilitator, right? He can't learn a physics lesson, then leave that lesson and respond with his mother. He can write that poetry that's so eloquent and beautiful, but he can't tell you what is in a physics lesson with his mother if she's not there at the lesson. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And it could be even simpler than... What, what is that echo? Do you guys hear it? I heard it when you were talking, yeah. When I talk, yeah, I hear it. Oh, that's weird. So it could be even simpler than a physics lesson. It could be just the basics of like, is this, you know, let's show you this and not this. How yeah. could he have gone through school without being tested at all? Does he get tested on spelling, on math, on history, on the comprehension of what he just read in a book, on a lecture? There is testing going on. He's gone through college. Mm -hmm. How do you get to that point without saying, sorry, I can't be tested because it makes me uncomfortable. And if I'm tested, then, then it's a problem. But we can't, well, we can't get to the point. This person, Deej and his parents, is gone. There's, there's no way those parents are going to turn around and say, we've spent, you know, since fourth grade with this kid. And sure. now oh, all this time, we really were just talking to each other. We were just talking to the facilitator. Our child didn't have anything to say. This was not part of the conversation. The, all that person we thought we knew, that's not him. They can't leave now. It's the it's people who are just starting, who are just being introduced to it, who are just hearing about it for the first time. Those are the people that have to stop. These other people, there's nothing we could do to make them change their minds. It's, it's beyond gone. Mm -hmm. it, it would be... It would be I can't even imagine having a parent saying, oh, yeah, the last 15 years that I thought I was speaking to my son actually was a lie. No. I, I, yeah, I mean, it, it would, 
it's exceptionally difficult. What's interesting to me, because I've obviously I've been involved with it in one way or another <laughs> since the early 90s when this thing started in the United States. And at the beginning, it was talked about more as a technique, a communication technique. And now it seems to be when I look at the facilitators now, the facilitators have taken on this identity. So there is they're even more integral to the, the communication process than I think was intended originally. And um, and I don't know how they can extricate themselves. You know, like I, I personally believe um, that FC really is about the facilitator and not so much about people with disabilities. And and it's in, I I I wonder about like what are the the social or the the psychological. Um, issues around that that hold people in that place where they can't really look outside it's a social social world too these are this is a group of people who've bonded and if you were to leave you know like much as in a, a cult or a church or what i mean a very very uh, tightly net community if you were to to walk away or start questioning it well first off you'd probably be shunned there would be all these other things happen but if they can't allow that to happen because if you say, you know what, my son has not been really communicating all this time. I've been watching this series on Facebook with Janice Boyton and Craig Foster, and they've enlightened me, and now I know that this is this is not real. How can that community say, oh, well, that's nice. Bye. I'll see you at Christmas, you know, whatever. It's like, no, because then now you're challenging my son, and you're challenging my daughter and the work I've been doing all these years. So we can't, we, you can't do that. You can't leave without if you leave we're going to rip you to pieces i think that's true for we're seeing it as we try to approach universities who who in my opinion should know the difference between science versus pseudoscience or, or you know also viability um, yeah craig talked in his paper about disputed science you know there's there's something in the middle where where there's debate and there should be debate um then those those organizations i think um haven't been necessarily been open to accepting that the research shows that it's facilitator influence so no locked into this cycle i think some of the universities are too because they've been like syracuse has been promoting it for 30 years how can they all of a sudden say oops you know <laughs> you were wrong so I, I think some of the things that Craig was talking about earlier about distractions, they very quickly when the, I think the, the skeptic and science community has, has been very clear about who's doing the pointing. That's the issue. Who's doing mm -hmm. the pointing? But the, the FC community or proponents will say, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's not about that. It's about disabilities or, or uh, disability rights or human rights or um, access to um, reasonable accommodations or whatever it is and there's always this distraction around it that has been very harmful to the people that are um, speaking out because they're they're quickly characterized as people who are against all those things human rights I haven't met anybody on the critical side and and i've actually because i've wanted to understand my situation i've reached out to people i haven't met any critic of the technique facilitated communication or rapid prompting method that hasn't also believed in human rights disability right i mean it just doesn't exist it's i'm going to screen share something really quick that janice received and uh this is just the photograph if you guys can see autism should be covered by americans with disability act this is an opinion by somebody named wendy ross for the uh philadelphia Inquirer. look at this photograph you guys this man is this is our oops this is our pm this is rapid prompting method he has a cell phone right here on his lap do you see that why was why does he need a letter board held in the air with people pointing to where he's pointing to it, why does he need that when he has a, apparently the ability to use a cell phone? If he can communicate by text or by speaking into the cell phone or whatever, and then look at this headline. It's just like, this should be covered by 
the American Disabilities Act, did, did they pull this picture out thinking this is a typical autistic person? We've gone, we have got so much work to do. If somebody is somebody who's writing this article or whoever put the picture up, maybe it wasn't the person who wrote the article, somebody else used the photo, that they think that this is okay. I mean, this is RPM. Look at this. This is clear. On the back side of this thing, it has uh, multiplication, division, equals, and a set of numbers from zero to nine. And I assume on the other side, it has a letter board. Again, this is being held in the air. Um, and it is, this, this has been debunked 30, 40 years ago. Well, maybe not RPM, but the, <clears throat> this is what we're, we're against. They're equating this with people who have autism who should be given, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm speechless, but this is what you're saying, because this is the point where we're trying to, they're equating this with um, people who have disabilities and should be given whatever needs possible to have them get out of this locked in situation they're in when, oh, it's just so frustrating. Well, look, in my experience, um, the, I mean, I, after I wrote the paper, I, I got, I received some criticism, um, not always really very polite. And I know other people have experienced it as well. And a lot of that criticism operates on the presumption that FC must be real. So it totally circumvents the debate. If FC works, then yes, I would understand covering that issue. But the sleight of hand, if you will, if you look at that headline is autism should be covered. Well, fine, cover autism, yes. But that's not what you're really saying. And this isn't what happens at the university level. And this isn't what people say when they're trying to get FC into the school system. They leave out the part that is, we aren't saying that you shouldn't accommodate people that have complex communication needs. The problem is that if that facilitator is exerting influence, the facilitator graduated from Grinnell High School and the facilitators graduated from Oberlin, not the person. So in order for that to, um, to be accepted, they have to demonstrate that FC can work independent of facilitator influence. And in, I mean, we've known this for 25 years. I am not aware of one, not one team that has demonstrated that they can do it. I believe there is a fairly substantial cash prize <laughs> if you can do this and nobody can do it. So what, what you see there, I mean, that's, that's the one logical issue. I'm, I'm thanking my, my um, philosophy of logic professor, Dr. Rafalco from 25 years ago. It, it has to do with arguments that presume that the conclusion's true. But the other thing that you see that's, I mean, there's two things you touched on that are really, really critical to understanding of this process and people believing in pseudoscience. And the one is motivated reasoning. And the motivated reasoning argument is, and it's a powerful, power, powerful, powerful phenomenon, is people have a number of different rules and examples, and they pull out rules and examples that get them to their desired conclusion. So they might use one premise in one instance and a different premise in another instance, but they pull out the premises to match what they want to have happen. So for example, Diversity and inclusion is something that we all celebrate. Mm -hmm. Well, they, you go to diversity and inclusion because it feels correct in this instance. And it's also hard for people to argue against diversity and inclusion because then you have to go through this process of going, look, it's not that. We're taking it a step deeper. It's who's doing the responding. That's the issue. But the motivated reasoning part of it is people bring out the arguments to lead them to the conclusion they want. That is the argument people go to because they want to believe that FC works and that FC should be in the school. They don't go to the argument, which is uh, we should test it. We, it needs to be demonstrated as reliable before we put it into the school. The other thing that happens that you touched on that I don't wanna lose is that the social influence is tremendously, tremendously powerful. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think, safe to say it's a lot easier for that social influence to be more powerful today because you, you befriend people on Facebook, Twitter, other forms of social media. 
Um, and you can just get new sources that reinforce your existing point of view over and over and over again. And those communities will share arguments that reinforce the folk theories that exist at the core of the group. And so those phenomena are, are really quite powerful. I remember, so I went to a Flat Earth conference in Denver. It was a, a big one. It was like the National Flat Earth Conferences in Denver. It was only an hour north of me. So I was like, okay, I've got to go. And I went to the Flat Earth Conference and I, I met um, uh, a number of people who believe in the Flat Earth. I met people that were there like me. They were journalists that were globers, if you will. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, and it, it's not, I don't think it's, I didn't take it as a disparaging term. Like it, the, the community, the people I met, were generally really pretty, they were really friendly. It was like a normal conference. And you, people marvel at the flat earth thing, but you, I go there as a psychologist and I watch two days of talks, formal and informal, that are just about how crazy all these people are for believing that the earth is round. And if you become a flat earther, you're gonna be welcomed into this new community. And I asked myself, if you just took 100 people off the street and gave them free tickets to this conference, how many of them would leave and go, man, I'm really not sure about this globe earth thing anymore? It, I don't know. I mean, it's an experiment that we can't do. But I, I think it's more than people think. Because they, like, they know. They know the arguments to use with Globers. Before I go, people are like, they're like, hey, ask them about sunsets. Ask them about seasons. And I'm like, I'm not going to do any of these things. I, they have arguments for all these things. They want to debate with you. And mm -hmm. it's just that mm -hmm. social phenomenon is, is really, really powerful. And uh, it, look, it, it's, just, it, it's just those two things, right? The, the desire to believe and the pulling out of rules that support the belief, right? The, the oh, I couldn't perform today because I was stressed um, and not recognizing that it, set up, it sets up a non-falsifiable theory that nobody can debunk mm -hmm. and the, the echo chamber that occurs in a tight-knit community. I mean, that's what keeps this thing going. I think um, it's also being promoted as a technique of last resort. So if you if you look at, and it doesn't just have to be the Deej movie, it's, there's another movie called The Reason I Jump and Wretches and Jabbers and there's books and poetry and stuff and it all sort of has similar themes, but it's, it's if you watch the patterns of people who are um, involved with FC, they've tried a lot of the evidence-based methods. It's being promoted as the, the, the FC is being promoted as the method of last resort. So you're already primed in some ways to need it to work because what else, you know, in, in, I mean, I think there's other things to try, but, but in the, in the mind of a facilitator or a potential facilitator, they're saying to themselves, if I don't try this and if it doesn't work, there is nothing else. So, you know, and I think that the, the promoters, whether it's overtly or covertly, understand this on some level and, and they're, they're, they're designing their workshops and they're designing their, their marketing techniques to pull these people in and it gives them a place to go. It gives mm -hmm. them a place to, to be wanted and, and, you know, feel wanted and included. And, and I think that's as much as part yeah. of the social bonding these they're in a situation else. with these children that they're raising that are that a lot of people can't understand i mean i wouldn't be able to understand what experiences and the things that they have to go through this is completely a world that is alien to me and so you're bonding with other people who have who are in the same situation what other what other group would you want to be in i mean I, anyway we haven't shown the trailer <laughs> we were going to show uh, can i say one more thing before we go to the trailer on this point mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, well, obvious to us, several organizations that include a lot of expertise uh, have written position statements against FC and RPM. Uh, I mean, many of them. And one of the organizations is the American Psychological Association. And the American Psychological Association did something that was, I thought, really thoughtful. And it probably is related to the fact that it's a psychological organization. But they began, if I'm remembering correctly, their position statement with 
saying something that's basically, you know, sometimes science tells us things that we don't really want to be true. But as scientists, you, you have to go after the truth, even when that truth isn't necessarily friendly or helpful. And that's what's going on here. It isn't the happy story, but we can't neglect that because of the harm that can occur if we don't accept the truth. So just real quickly by analogy, you, you go, what if, this is the, the analogous argument to what goes on with, um, with FC. So let's say I created a, a drug that treated uh, depression. And the drug had no evidence that it did any good, but it had side effects that were occasionally really pretty harmful. And so you administer this drug to people, and then you find no evidence that it actually works. And then people say, well, it could work, so keep using it. And you go, well, there's no evidence that it works. It has these side effects that are bad, right? Should we keep administering that drug? When you take it out of the FC context, I think most people would say, no, why would you give somebody a treatment that has harm and no evidence that it works? But in the context of FC, what people say is, they go, but it could work. Look at the results. And you say, no, those results are false. And the it's also harmful. And it's harmful because of the, the stress that people with complex communication needs are going through. It's harmful because of the false accusations of assault. Um, it's uh, harmful because of the small number of cases where people have thought there was consent for sexual activity. And then so basically people are becoming, uh, they're sexually assaulting people mm -hmm. with learning disabilities and complex communication needs. So it doesn't make any sense. FC just goes on and on and on again under the assumption that it could work when there's no evidence that it does work. That's a great point. I'm going to take off my headset and see if I can get rid of this echo because this is really strange that I keep hearing this echo whenever I talk to you guys. Can you guys on Facebook hear this echo that I'm, I seem to be making? It takes them about 15. What is that? Can you hear me? Okay, you can hear me. Yeah. An echo. You're quiet. I can't hear you guys. Oh, I turned my volume down on my speaker so far. Okay, let's see. I had two questions from uh, from Linda Rosa. One was, uh, are there facilitators who have been tested without being asked to be tested? And significant financial uh, expense for a family, what effects are there for the government to cover their expenses? I'm not aware of um, facilitators being tested unknowingly. I at least from my experience being a psychologist, I think that would violate the IRB guidelines that we have to go through to make sure studies are ethical. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, if it's happened, I'm not aware of it. I mean, it reminds me of the old NRA's um, oh, yeah. pseudoscience, right? Where uh, the investigator went and, um, and turned the treatment condition off and uh, the person, um, uh, Blombot, I think his name was, said he still see the end rays. He's like, really? Because I turned the whole thing off. But uh, I'm not aware of that happening with um, with FC. Um, the what the Janice, you would probably know better than I do. I don't know of um, to what degree FC might be covered under insurance plans that are supported by the government. Um, um, we know. We know that in um, Vermont, I think it's state by state, we know that in Vermont for sure that they allow Medicaid um, reimbursement for um, facilitated communication. And, and in that state, the designated, some of the designated agencies also hire people to um, use facilitated communication with their clients and, and they're paid through state funds as well. Um, I don't know, I haven't, um, well, I haven't looked that deeply, but I haven't uh, uh, just a cursory look. I don't know of any other state that's doing that, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. I would, I would think that if uh, that that's um, if it's happening one place, then it probably is happening in other places as well. As is my assumption. Janice, um, Linda's asking. As she wants me to clarify, she's saying she means have they subjected themselves to testing voluntarily? And one of the things I want to say, and this oh. is with all the stuff that we know of in psychics and so on, 
uh, water witching, you know, dousing, everything, is that we don't necessarily see the negative. So if somebody has come in, learned about facilitated communication, self-tested themselves and left, and left and didn't, um, you know, didn't make a splash about it, we don't know. I mean, people could have come in and said, oh, I can douse. And they tried dousing, you know, and they found that it failed. And I never know I've, because they didn't, they weren't already involved in it. Yeah, I've heard um, back from some people that they use facilitated communication and then because of the language that was coming out that was much higher at another much higher level than the person they were working with say a six-year-old was all of a sudden talking like college level sentences that they themselves kind of questioned it they were maybe skeptical to begin with they they tried it and then they saw they saw some clues and they stopped using it i think that that's possible um, I also think that um, some of the facilitators, the pro FC people have set up their own tests um, to prove FC, but the problem with that is they generally include the facilitators in the, the test protocol. Right. So there's no blinding that's done. And, and so their, their results in terms of um, success generally uh, there was one study where they did they, they they're big on um, testing in situ because they're afraid that that um, scientific controlled testing is too like lab like which it isn't but that's what the myth is around it so they they set up this testing where the the um, the students and the facilitators did things around the school and the the one person that actually passed test um, the test was somebody that um typed out that he had gone to the the um the um, vending machine and got some chips well it turns out later they looked at it again and the the facilitator could smell fritos on the on the breath of the person that was facilitated so she she also knew that that um the the facilitators in that situation knew that they might be visiting the vending machine or doing a particular activity so she was already clued into an, an activity that might happen that she was aware of but then again the the sensory you know the smell of the fritos on the, on the child's breath and then he typed out i i got chips from the vending machine and they so, called that a success so, but then like they, psychic world. so, I can't so any anybody that's um set out to prove fc the the facilitators that don't have controls in place um adequate controls mm -hmm. um that's uh, mark mostert is is one of the people who's done a um uh, the systematic reviews he's going to be talking to us um soon um but he he's mentioned in his articles, the more controls that are placed on facilitated communication, the less likely it's going to work. So, so the, all the successes of FC, all the, te the testing that's out in the articles that, that FC works has, has the least amount of controls. And but, there's, there's an important follow on to this because what you're saying, Janice, is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. But if you want to understand this in terms of this particular example of pseudoscience notice what happens so the the best study that it, i don't even want to call it best but probably the most effortful study is like the kluwer study from 1996 and it's really pretty clever so they argue that it's a more natural setting but if you get into the weeds of the study which most did they're able to identify look here's how the communication could have occurred. So you didn't really rule out facilitator authorship as a possible alternate explanation. So basically, nice try, no go, the study doesn't prove anything. We all understand that. But just as an example, and this isn't the only place it's going to occur, but I'm gonna to go to the heart of this, which is now just up the street. And I didn't move to be near Syracuse. That's just- I was like, wondering, we've but, been wondering about that. But if you go to their webpage, that research is going to be it's going to be promoted on par with the other research right they will i just, i mean i looked it's been six months but in doing my research i looked so they will have a a web they'll have a link that's research supporting fc 
and they'll have a link that says research critical of FC. So I'm sure from their perspective, they're like, well, look, we, we put it out there. Okay, granted, I have to go through a couple of pages to get there, but it is on their webpage. But what this entails then, if you want the public to be educated consumers, is they have to actually get to the point where they are reading Mostert's review, or they're reading these studies and seeing these nuances in the research. Most people aren't going to do that, and we can't expect them to do it. So if they don't dig deeper, what they hear is, oh, I guess there's some debate. On the ICI webpage, that debate is going to be like, obviously promoted in their favor, which to be fair is what an organization is typically going to do, but they aren't, a typical reader isn't going to get there. It's something I wrote about with a student of mine, Serena Ortiz, that happens in anti-vaccination. They'll, they'll promote this wild number of studies and it always escalates because I guess the next person that's an anti-vaccination proponent wants to outdo the previous one, but it starts with like 12 studies that demonstrate vaccines are harmful. And then eventually I saw a book and it's like 400 studies that vaccines are harmful. <laughs> I'm like, you guys are going too far with this. But they work because most people aren't going to read the original research. They don't have time. No. And so they just need to, it, it, it just people hear it and they go, yeah, whatever. And they move on. Yeah. So go ahead, please. I was just going to say in the workshops, they downplay it too. I, I did a talk and I mean, it's been a long time since I've personally been in a workshop. So I, I um, did a talk at Syracuse University with an ethics teacher there last year. And she has people that come over that have, they're taking classes at the ICI and she introduces truly both sides of the issue and the, the, it's an evidence-based class and um, they're hearing it for the first time. So, and that's directly from her. That's not something that I've, you know, that, that I, she teaches the course every single year and she gets people in her classroom that are currently taking classes at the ICI and they've never come across the evidence-based research in the way that they're taking it seriously. And so what ICI stands for? Um, it's the Institute on Communication and Inclusion. That it used to be facilitated communication institute but they changed it purposely changed it um to fly the quote from the newspaper article is to fly under the radar because they were getting so much um, negative press in the 1990s that they changed it the name of the facilitated communication institute Isn't that amazing? I, I will say that they at least um if you get past the title the last time i looked they at least take that stand they're clearly a pro FC community. I mean, they just, they say we train people in FC. It, I, I do appreciate that they are not hiding that by renaming it and, and forcing uh, people to go through more confusion. Well, they're branding. Yeah, I do. Their branding is, is more supported typing now than facilitated communication. You have to dig down just a little. They, they still say um, facilitated communication, but that the primary branding is supported typing which so is, which is okay it doesn't matter what they call it somebody's got to be able to show somebody that can do it it's been 1993 is what i say is the turning point for when facilitator authorship was clearly established as a as an explanation for many of the successes that uh, fc promoted and i only say many because you can't test everybody that's the that's the gimmick that that keeps this going is i think the community expects that you have to debunk everybody no you have to show us that it works you you brought up several cases where you said it works um some of these were tested and they always failed they you need to just show one group to start just one couple that can do it just one it, yeah. it doesn't happen we're waiting I'm, I'm still waiting and i'm going to show this trailer now because yep. we're an hour in plus and we haven't showed the trailer that we're supposed to be talking about <laughs> which is fine I, well, I we've talk. been talking about we've been talking about deeds we've well, been yeah, talking, talking about deeds, but people i'm sure want to see right so this is a documentary following a young man for 10 years or nine years or something like that they follow him along and they've been and they've been filming him all this time and as Rob Palmer was just uh, noting, he says that the, he's wondering about the editing to show Deej 
in the best light possible. I personally think that the people who are filming him have to know that this is, that they're depicting him in a way that it isn't happening. I can't see being in, being a camera person following this person around and watching this happen in front of your eyes and not seeing it for what it is. I mean, it's different if it's his mom or something, but no, no, I, 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 I'm not giving him a pass. So I'm going to show this trailer. Uh, it's two minutes, 30 seconds. And um, this is just the beginning. This is just part of the, the documentary you can find on PBS, which is only on PBS. Uh, oh Lord, if it hits uh, Netflix or something like that, it's going to be massive, but um, it is a very feel good uh, feeling. And that is, keep in mind as you're watching this, that what you're seeing is very little of him being facilitated and a lot of uh, re pre-recorded um, his computerized voice, which we don't know how that was recorded. We have. Yeah, no we actually do. We actually do. We do. Oh, him um, facilitating with his mom and then pressing a button to activate the communication. Um, and so if they hadn't have shown that scene, I would say that we don't really know, but um, I would say that it's likely that since they, they were showing that, that it's likely that's how they got the rest of the, the vocals well, as we well. We don't know all of this audio, if it was done with DJ or if mom just typed it in ahead of time, we don't know. It's not done in real time for us to see. And we also do not see him facilitating. And uh, it's a lot of him walking or somebody else doing his poetry and, and close-ups of his face and just watch the editing, watch the interaction and this feel good kind of thing. And we'll talk about it on the other side. I love that quote. I've been watching a lot of news and I think that that fits really good. Okay. Let me, let me hit, um, my sit. hold on. I didn't share screen first. I'm bracing myself. I watched this documentary three times when I was writing the paper very, very carefully. Okay. It's very hard to watch this, but this is just the trailer because otherwise we will just never get um, through this. Okay, can you guys see that? Let me hit play. This is Deej. My senses always fall in love. They spin, swoon. They lose themselves in one another's arms. Your senses live alone like bachelors, like bitter, slanted rhymes whose marriage is a sham. Most people still perceive what is understand. Until I learned to read and write, people thought I had no mind. People just don't understand, I guess. Trust that they can learn. Reading and writing are rarely taught in non speaking autistics. To plot to get my people free to help the other kids have meaningful lives. Here's what a normal would look like. I plan to go as a combo. I look hopefully forward to a golden life of full inclusion. You currently have students who plan to communicate instead of speaking. Um, we do not. Yes, do you look at this very real? Absolutely, people. Everybody has different things about them. Yes, I fear losing you. Wow, DJ. Deej, we would never desert you. We would never leave you on your own. Imagine for a minute that you are removed from your home for reasons no one bothers to tell you, because you can't speak, so they assume you can't hear or think or feel. The prodigal son has returned, spitting image of a lucky strike for snarling, wistful me who once thought anger was a kind of redemption. You got to practice saying it. Got into what? Over uh, number one choice. The world outside greets you either as a hopeful exception or as a real burden to society. Mm -hmm. How should I hold up here and go to college individually? You're just going to grow into it. And only you can do it, Deej. Nobody can do it for you. Being included is everything's right. It shouldn't be a lottery. Oops, sorry. 
Where my mouse? always fall in love. They spin. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. They lose this. The uh, mouse decided it was going to be doing some weird stuff here. So it didn't let me, didn't let me stop it as, as eloquently as I could have. Well, y'all. <laughs> so, so Wait. I was trying to get it at the end. Hope you all like that. We've watched that many, many times. And who wants to start? Well, I mean, I, I, each, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think if we try to be fair, the question is given everything we know about facilitated communication, given that we've known about facilitator authorship for decades, decades, and there's no debate that it can happen. Does Deej, is Deej ever shown communicating in ways that can't be explained with facilitator authorship? He's just not. So, I mean, I, I can't definitively say that it isn't Deej communicating. I, I'm not planning to go visit Deej. I, I'm not, I doubt I'd be welcome, but um, it, it's the same old story. It, it's just, it's the same old um, psychological appeal, right? It, it is just FCs introduced and it's the same story. Deej suddenly could communicate better. The, um, and the idea of facilitator authorship is present to people who are aware of it as an explanation, and it's not mentioned anywhere in the story. So if you're not aware of the power of the ideal motor effect and the how well-established facilitator authorship is, that part of the story is easy to miss. The other thing that I will add, and it just surprises me to no end, is the sexual themes in Deej because of how that mirrors the um, times in FC's history where FC has generated comments about sexuality that led to false accusations or sexual assault onto people with complex communication needs. Um, it, that part, if I just, it, it's just the same old story. It, you can see, I mean, Deej's family, they look like wonderful people. Uh, the, the caring that they show in a different context is exactly what you would want to see in a family supporting somebody like um, Deej and supporting each other. But it, it just isn't evident. And I, I, will, I will pass this over saying, um, in some of the criticism I heard, somebody said, but Deej has communicated independently. And I say, okay, put it in the video. If that's fine, put it in the video. Or they say, well, Deej can't communicate independently. And I go, that's fine. Why is he using FC then? Why is he using a technique that can lead to such problems if he can communicate independently? The things that he has shown doing, you could draw, you could ask him a multiple choice question and draw big, huge boxes up on a whiteboard and just say, Deej, go to the board and press A, B, C, or D. And if, if I were able to see enough evidence there was no chicanery, we would eventually have to accept that Beach has this hidden intelligence, but it's just not shown. It's just the same old story without any mention of the opposing point of view uh, or the established point of view, I should say, which is facilitator influence. Wendy has a really good point. I just want to point this out. She says he's wearing glasses. Does he respond to the optometrist or does the facilitator? Well, I mean, it depends on how he's responding, but if he's, if he's typing out these sophisticated responses while somebody's holding his hand, we don't know. But given what we know about FC, I very much doubt that he has this hidden intelligence because it's the same old story. It really, it gets to the heart of this whole issue. FC is a, an expensive, time-consuming practice that will stress people with complex communication needs by leading them into situations that are not suited for them. So 
until there is any evidence that it works, we should not be promoting it and using it. it you need to show me that the treatment works before we accept the expense and the harm associated with it. And I, there's no way to see in that documentary. I mean, I watched it looking for that. That's what I looked for. Was there any communication that existed that couldn't be explained by facilitator authorship? No, it's really clever. That beginning just shows his hand. It doesn't show what's going on outside of it. So it's a fair convention that a documentary might use but it doesn't demonstrate independent communication. You don't know what's going on uh, aside from that. If you believe in it, it sure feels like it's Deej, the way the narratives are set up, but if you know the history of FC, you watch it and you can just say, this is the same old story. This, this, was, this is just, it's the frontline video from 1993. It's nothing new. It's the same old story with no new evidence that, uh, that it's working. This is a major criticism of pseudoscience is that they just make the same arguments year after year after year and they don't really progress anywhere. If they progress somewhere, they wouldn't be pseudoscience. They would be part of a scientific debate. It's the same story. It's, it's just not really new from what I can see. If you, if you know um, DJ's story as well, um, they, there's a point where they talk, they actually show what is probably a legitimate communication device it's like a notebook and it has some um, cards on it and stuff that's a that's maybe a picture exchange or you know some a graphic communication device and they talk but they're if you listen to the narrative they're talking about all of a sudden in the fourth grade um, all these things clicked all the sentence structure and language abilities clicked and you all of a sudden he was able to communicate but what they leave out of the documentary is as important as what they've put in and if you know DJ's history it's in the newspapers he was trained and facilitated communication at the University of Northern Iowa by one of the master trainers from Syracuse University so they you have to piece together some of the the result of that but but that to me along with the visuals that they're giving us in the in the um movie itself that are clearly facilitator authored um and and the knowledge that he was trained at at the university of northern iowa and facilitated communication you have to you have to or i i will <laughs> i have made the leap that all of it since fourth grade is facilitated authored and if 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 they can show that it's something different please do and i am willing to accept that but but this is their best they're promoting they're they're they're, they're showing the world dj at his best and at his best he's using facilitated communication right. that's no concerning there. to me there's no independence well, at all well, there's a theme in there that I think is important to recognize, and um, I can't remember how clearly it was stated in the, the trailer because I've, I've watched each enough that I, I, you know, I'm remembering what I saw in the right. video. But uh, much of Deej, not I shouldn't say much, some of Deej involves how he has changed the perceptions among his peers about what it means to have a disability. And this is a dangerous, dangerous idea. Yes, it feels really good to have high school students saying, oh, you've completely changed how I think about people with disabilities. People with disabilities don't actually have disabilities. It, I think it is fair to say that is the sentiment that the documentary promotes. Now, inadvertently, what I worry about is what they are saying is, if, if, what it implies or suggests is what happens to people who are like Deej or Deej if they don't have hidden intelligence? Are, are, they, are they suddenly disappointing because they don't have this secret gift that we somehow need this person to have? Deej doesn't need to go to Oberlin College for me to value him, right? I get it, right? We, we all want people we care about to have as many skills and abilities as we can cultivate in those people. But I do think it is a dangerous precedent to suggest that 
This is what makes Deej valuable. Look at the story. Look at all these amazing things he can do. No, people with learning disabilities, people with complex communication needs, they can do amazing things that aren't going to Oberlin College. I, it, I just worry that it, it, in addition to all the most obvious things about what educational programs we should offer, the stress that families go trying to manage this, we can value people with complex communication needs for who they really are. That doesn't have to be a threat. That's a very good point. Let me show you just a real quick uh, snippet of the uh, Q&A that was done after the movie was shown in, uh, at a film festival in New York. And what's happening in this is there's a woman sitting on the stage. They had uh, several chairs on the stage uh, after the movie was over. And DJ and his mother were supposed to come sit on the stage uh, and be interviewed with, uh, and Deej decided apparently to stay in the audience and um, his mother standing, is sitting beside him and she has a keyboard or something, uh, I think it's a laptop, I think. And so they're asking him questions as if he is totally competent. I mean, question after question after question, Deej, um, is this gonna be shown in other places? Deej, what do you think of this? Deej, what do you think of that? And the mother, as you will see, DJ, there's a couple questions that have already been fed to the uh, person who's asking questions. I'm not going to show that part. You guys can look at this, uh, this yourself. It's called DJ Q&A. And she asks these questions as if it just occurred to her. And then DJ, they press a button on the laptop and a computerized voice answers that really eloquently. Okay, these are pre-prepared questions. But when they get to the questions from the audience and things like that, Deej just is like getting up, flapping his hands, spinning around, walking around. And his mother's trying to contain him, like, sit down, sit down, you know, like, and, uh, and they keep moving the chairs off the, like, Deej wants to go sit on the, on the stage, and then they move the chairs away, and then they move the chairs back when it looks like he wants to go back, and the mother starts answering the questions. Um, like somebody will say something and they'll one person in the audience asks the mother, what do you think, you know, asking the mother and the mother says, I'm not answering any questions. I'm only facilitating Deej today. I'm not answering any questions. But then here is Deej being asked these questions and Deej, and she looks him right in the face and he says, or, or, or you know, just some notion. And she answers it in full sentences. There's no facilitation going on. There's no keyboard. There's no letter board. There's no RPM. She just starts answering as if she's answering in his voice fully well that he is not saying this. Now watch, I'm just gonna show a real quick bit of this um, for your listening pleasure. Okay, let's make this large screen. Let's hit plus. To uh, adopt and be able to take on um, such a, a commitment and have such a love. So Jen is all but ABD at Syracuse University, and we are friends for life. So mom is not taking questions. She's currently just translating for Deej. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Oh, let me just give you a microphone. Estonia Film Festival is abroad in foreign countries. Is it being screened in foreign countries? So not yet, but China and and the UK might might film it. I mean, screen it. Great. Any other questions? Yeah, on the right over here. Two questions. Um, one. Our son right here, Ezra, he, he's learning facilitated communication and RPM as well, and it's up and down. And I was wondering if 
um, I mean, he's doing an amazing job, but I was wondering if DJ could give him any, any advice about his own experience that he went through to learn how to talk through this. So the question was, um, the person who asked the question, son is learning digital communication and RPM. Deej, do you have any words of wisdom or advice about your personal experience with this journey? Uh, so choice boards and actually physically touching the words helped a lot at first rather than spelling. Okay, I'm going to end it right there. Great. We know darn well that that is not what. Oops, hold on. Thank you. Another one? Oops. Okay. Okay. They ended okay. Let me hand up the screen share. We know darn well that that is not what the mother, what DJ was communicating to the mother. There was no letter board, there was no RPM, there was, she, he was mouthing words to her that weren't necessarily the words and she was just coming out with full sentences of what what she wanted to say i'd uh, say in watching that there was real communication going on with dj he was moving away from the mic and moving away from the stage and jumping up and down and he was there. under distress um that to me um his his nonverbal language was seemed to be more powerful at that point than anything that he was communicating through someone else. I have a, a quote from uh, last night we played trivia. I play trivia every Thursday night. You guys are all welcome to come and join us 630 Pacific time until we open the door at seven o'clock. It goes late. And we went until 10 playing trivia and then two hours later just having discussion. Several people were, have been following the series of uh, Janice and I talking about facilitated communication and Wendy Hughes was saying last night, and I think this is eloquent, she says, the mom is having an imaginary relationship with her son. I felt like that kind of sums it up. It is happening. What she sees is what she wants to see. Um, I mean, I would agree. The, I, I think we can all sympathize with um, the relationship between parent and child is going to be I mean, it, the most emotional and meaningful relationship that most people have in their lives. And I, but yeah, it, I, I would say that statement is true. The, in terms of the idea of motivated reasoning and, and the worldview that's created, I think it's easier for an outsider to say how, but even in the documentary you see bits and pieces of how all of this is rationalized in a way that i think we can sympathize with and basically uh, i believe either the voiceover or somebody says i think it's it's the voice that is attributed to deej that that sometimes i have these sort of fits basically is what he says uh, not physical fits but where my mind goes somewhere else and mm -hmm. I mean, that's an explanation that justifies how all this can be occurring. Because to an outsider, you say, okay, you graduated from Oberlin, I believe with honors, if I'm remembering correctly, and you can't just stay at the stage and answer these questions? That, that doesn't make sense. But in the, if you really put yourself in the totality of somebody else's worldview in this case, and where they've been led over the course of several years, all of these issues have been addressed somewhere along the road. And you know, that's, that's part of how they view this. It's really differently than, than an outsider would view this very same um, situation. Yeah, uh, we had Catherine Beals on a couple of weeks ago and she's a, a linguist and has studied um, autism in particular because she has a son who's autistic and her comment one of her comments that stuck with me was that um, when you have a person with autism in particular that that has um, very challenging behaviors it challenges what it means to be a parent 
you know, and, and so you can, you can see how FC can be sort of a, a coping mechanism in some ways. Um, it opened, you know, the, I'm not a parent, but I can imagine that, that parents want to be told by their son or daughter, I love you, mom or dad, and they want to be able to have that conversation with their son and daughter. And if you have someone with autism who's, um, the part of autism is that there's the, those social skills and facial recognition and all that responses, the social responses are impaired in some way, then you can see how that opens up the way for, for something like FC to step in. I, I think it's wise. I, I remember when I was at this Flat Earth conference, there was an extensive discussion of one video that NASA promoted. And the conclusion of this discussion was that uh, little bits of, of, um, of dust or something in the video, if you thought about it, indicated that the video was somehow shot underwater in a laboratory or something like that. And this is the kind of thing that when you uh, believe in something that's scientifically unconventional, is you can lead the debate into all these little sub-debates that miss the heart of the story. So I would encourage everybody to um, not forget, right, that the heart of FC is nobody has ever been able to demonstrate it reliably, you know, and not to get too caught up in the rabbit hole of what is Deej. But if you think about Deej as a particular example, in the documentary, and I, I noted this in the paper, the only independent communication you see is one word. And he, he enunciates um, the beginning of the word family and the uh, therapist helps him finish it. So this just is part of what really doesn't make sense. So he's promoted as this success story in, in FC and he is, and this is fine. I mean, I don't want to sound judgmental of Deej. This is uh, who Deej is. He struggles to say the word family. Well, if that's the case, how is he giving this sophisticated response to the mom? It, it doesn't make any sense at all. What the story that makes sense is he's not doing that because that's not who Deej is. Deej has been robbed of his autonomy, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's dragged around and other people are speaking for Deej. It's, it's really sad. He, his autonomy has been compromised. It's been compromised for benevolent and understandable reasons, but it's been compromised. And that's what people need to understand that the uh, critics of FC are trying to, to do. They don't, they don't want to hurt people. I, Deej's mom and dad, they seem like great people. I don't want to hurt them, but Deej deserves to live with autonomy. Absolutely. And these kinds of films, I mean, if this was the life the child was leading and the parents were self-funding this and we weren't using government aid, and the parents are fairly well, wealthy from what I understand, because I know that they're huge contributors to, to uh, keeping Syracuse University um, in, in, in the chips. And what I'm wondering is, well, what, what frustrates me is that when these documentaries come out that are carefully edited, as Rob Palmer said, these are carefully edited to provoke an emotion that finally we're able to take these people out of a locked in uh, position and give them voice. And if only we'd all look around and all these people who have communication problems like Deej does, they could all be locked out. You know, they could all be whatever it is, released, and, and everybody, they're all just people walking around who could have college degrees in them and have happy, loving lives, and that, this is a, this is a fairy tale we're telling ourselves, and we're setting ourselves up, as Craig is saying, you're setting these people up as some, uh, on a pedestal of perfectness, and, and this is how it works whenever everything's great, and if your child can't do this, then it may be your fault or the, the education's fault or you're not devoting enough of your uh, uh, resources and you're not facilitating with them long enough. And, and the, we get down to the thing, these people are who they are. This is who they are. And pretending otherwise is, is harmful, not only to the child, but to the family and the students in the class with them. I can't imagine what it'd be like to have to go through classes where I'm trying to understand the subject and I'm trying to really get this and I have somebody hopping around in the classroom. I don't know if they're, I mean, how would I test? I know that sounds very uh, me, 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 but the point is, is that people have 
learning have disabilities of trying to concentrate they have all sorts of other issues in their own life and we don't need somebody else in the classroom who is screaming out and things when you're trying to learn a subject what's wrong well, why, why don't those people have some sort of you know i mean look it you bring up a great point i mean they they went abraham lincoln on it right though that abraham lincoln part of the documentary is my people need to be emancipated mm -hmm. So it, it is really a, a palpable part of the story, but it's harder to notice this in D and in, in FC than I think in other areas. And I'll say first, people, people notice and dislike pseudoscience when it's somebody else's pseudoscience, right? Nobody ever goes, Hey, I believe this pseudoscience because by definition, that doesn't make sense. If you, if you don't believe it's actual science, you would change your belief. And so they don't notice things when it's there. This is the motivated reasoning, right? They don't notice rules they're using that they wouldn't use in other cases. So people that are promoters of FC might disparage the science denial that is occurring around COVID or the science denial that occurs when people say evolution isn't real, but they won't notice how astounding the science denial is in FC and you see it in the video. It is, if you look at it from another perspective, it is tremendously offensive to the many, many people who have devoted their lives to try to understand people with learning disabilities and complex communication needs and to make their lives better. All of those experts, right? It is basically saying, you all missed this one. And we need this documentary to lead these people to their best lives. No, there's thousands and thousands of people working their asses off for not a lot of money to try to make the, these people's lives better. Mm -hmm. And to sit there and suggest that the entire community, every expert at every university, except for a couple at Syracuse and one at University of Northern Iowa, that they have all missed this, it just boggles the mind. It is, I know this sounds crazy, but it is a flat earther proportions, right? To suggest the scientific community is somehow totally missed this one. So when you watch the documentary and you're moved by the story and he just easy to like, mm -hmm. right? He's he just, he, he's a charismatic young man. Um, it's easy to just overlook how staggering that accusation is. That's a really good point. Very, very well done. Uh, Janice, I wanted you to say what Rob Palmer was watching the movie last night and what he was telling you. Uh, well, his reaction was pretty strong. You know, he, he, um, he was, I'll, I'll leave out the swear words, but, um, <laughs> he, yeah, <Go> ahead. <laughs> well, he said, holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to watch this as, as somebody who's not, this is not his expertise. This is a new, this is a new topic for him. And um, he's looking at it with um, much fresher eyes than I have it. And I asked him, he told me that he was um, going to watch it. And um, I asked him if he could give me some feedback. And the, the thing that stuck with me was he was saying that he, he was expecting the, the communication to be more discreet in some ways. You know, he was surprised that you could just obviously tell that the, the facilitators were moving the pencil when, when DJ was sitting on the couch and, and holding a pencil and the mom was facilitating or the, the person in the classroom was facilitating. So I think it was really shocking in some ways and, and sad that, that um, this was their best foot forward and it was still quite clear that it was, um, there was facilitator influence. They chose I to put this out. This is not a sting. This is not something that got you by the skeptic community. As we've been saying in all the, all the uh, lectures you and I have been doing together, they chose this. They chose to upload this. They chose it to edit it in this way. To be, they think this reflects well on Deej and all the other people in the community and the facilitators. When the mom is holding the microphone and she can hear the question and the child is going mom, 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 and she responds with a full two or three sentences that were not out of the mouth of that child, they chose to put that out. That is not... That's not part of the movie, but yeah, part of the question and answer. Yeah, yeah, they didn't have to release that that documentary. If they thought that this reflected badly on their child, they could have cut that out or not released it at all. 
but yet they choose to do it because I, I, I don't know that's the best they have or I don't know. No, no. I, I think that we need to appreciate that the facilitated communication community has played as honestly as they have. I mean, when people really want to believe in something, um, at some point, right, they, they can lead themselves to justify uh, dishonest and non-transparent acts. I mean, legitimate professors have falsified data, much to the, uh, uh, it, it, it's horribly unfortunate. It, it's a, a terrible, terrible thing to do. And we should be grateful that I think the pro FC data that's been published and these type of documentaries haven't resorted to deeper tricks that would that would take the discussion farther down the rabbit hole. The I I consider the documentary to be sort of transparently misleading because with the power of editing and the power of digital effects, uh, the producers could have been more, uh, could have been underhanded. But I think they kind of played within the rules of what documentaries are allowed to do. They're allowed to edit. They're allowed to intersperse poetry. They're allowed to put in narratives that seemingly come from above that you would naturally attribute to Geach from a psychological perspective. But I, I do think, like, I don't think a FC proponent has falsified data, frankly, because it would be better than it is. <laughs> and I, I mean that sincerely, but I, I agree. You do, you do have to sit back and say, I think you, I admire you for playing fair because the, the tricks I see using are there. When Bicklin did all those studies that were qualitative studies where he concedes that they're just using FC and people read these narratives that were generated through FC, he at least doesn't hide it. He says, this is what I'm doing. And it allows us to have a fair debate about it. But for all the reasons we've stated, I, I just don't think reasonably you can conclude that there's any evidence to support it. And that's why I uh, politely would call it pseudoscience because you can't call it better than that. If you call it something better than that, then you're gonna end up justifying it being on campuses. And this is another motivated reasoning issue that I thought of earlier and forgot so why I'm leading back to it now. But you know, people will play the, shouldn't campuses have debates? Of course they should, right? Like, yes, we need debates. But at some point the debate becomes so misleading and it's so old and tired that you just say, it's not a debate worth having. And everybody knows that at some point they understand that rule, right? That, that, that people could come in and, and give some uh, speech about um, misleading lies about race. And we'd go, well, we can't have that on campus. That's not science. So the standard of science has to be met before the debate can occur. And it, it just doesn't need it. And it never has. Um, Bicklin, in his 1990 um, paper, The Communication Unbound, which, which started this whole thing in the United States, at least, said that the, the, um, the evidence for independent communication was, quote, less than ironclad, but we're going to release this anyway. So they knew even from the beginning that they were, they were jumping over what I think the, the scientific, you know, skeptic community would say, you know, there's certain steps you need to prove it for, you know, what you're seeing is what's actually occurring. Um, before you move it into the public domain, and they purposely moved it into the public domain without going through those steps. So even from the beginning, um, and I don't know what the motivation is, I can guess, but I, you know, it's sort of like, it's unfortunate that that occurred because all this mess has happened since then. And, and like, I, I liken it to like, if you can, you can make a cake with rotten eggs, but it's still gonna taste gross when you eat it. You know what I mean? And oh, sort of, that's a good visual. <laughs> well, it is, um, it, to be fair, right, the, the vast majority of scientific laws that we see today were fledgling at some point. But Janice is 100% correct. The problem is that it um, it's, it has spun out of control in terms of something that appeals to the masses outside of being vetted by the scientific community. And the scientific community has vetted it and discarded it. 
Mm -hmm. And hey, what I don't get is, look, that happens. Um, you, you, have, you have done something valuable to science to offer a theory that's worth considering and then have it be refuted. That's how science works. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is that the scientists can explain through their expertise and their careful scrutiny that there is no evidence to support FC and the public never stopped championing it. That's what needed to happen in 1993. When those studies, when there were enough studies to show that facilitator influence was legitimate and Bicklin responded by saying, well, look, just because some people fail doesn't mean that the practice couldn't work somewhere with somebody. The sensible thing to do at that point would be to say, we need to shut this down as a publicly promoted practice until we can verify under controlled conditions that it actually works. That's what went wrong, right? They proposed a theory, the theory had an alternate explanation, the burden of proof is then on them to show that it works, and that never happened. And they just let it ride and they let it ride today. No, that, this is not on FC, but when you were talking about the Lincoln Memorial um, uh, scene, there was a, a scene where DJ kind of lags behind um, the person and the, the explanation is um, because he wanted to be independent. But I actually studied by Gene Mercer where they, they looked at toddlers. They wondered why toddlers lag behind wow. their parents, like in a mall. So they, they put a grid down and she said her, her partner um, that was helping her with the study wore pants that had a, a, a ruler down his leg so they could estimate how tall the children were. And what they, what they discovered was that um, the children were lagging behind so that they could see their whole parent. It gave them some sort of safety when they were, when they were walking behind them. If they, could, if they were closer, they would only see part of their parent. So I, so I emailed Jean and I asked her about that, that um, whether that could be um, extrapolated in some ways to DJs, because they, they made quite a big deal about how he was panicking during that time as well. Mm -hmm. And she said, I mean, it's hard to tell exactly for sure without talking to DJ, but she said it's quite possible that even as an adult with um, disability, you know, with developmental delays, it would be easier for him to um, to recognize the characteristic gates that we all have, the unique gates to the person that he's familiar with by standing at a distance. So <clears throat> what I came away from that was when I looked at the, the documentary as a whole that it's really sad to me that the documentary um, says that one of their themes is to show um people with disabilities in a college situation or high school or college but it really fails to show us what an individual with dj's um particular um issue is, uh, issues isn't a really good you know like his what his needs are to be supported it, it leaves out all of the support that he actually does need and that to me would have been much more valuable and interesting um, as a as a person who's looking at how can people with disabilities be included more? How can we support them more in these set settings? And that is, it's because they focus on the communication, which we know is faulty. They they I think they missed an opportunity to actually actually teach us what it what it is like for somebody that needs that much support. What is it like for the classroom teachers? What is it like for the parents. What is it like for the person with disabilities? I really would have liked to have that known. Would have been much more interesting. And I I'm think this for is that a missed today. opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we need to be summing up now because we are, as usual, over time because these conversations are very interesting. They're very, they're in depth, and it feels like we're always leaving something behind. And I love the conversations that are happening on Facebook. Um, with all the different kinds of things that are being said and I want to reply to them and they're so fascinating um, but the video will be remaining up on Facebook live for people to watch if they want to watch later I appreciate it so much that you guys have stayed with us we've had about the same I can see people started this and have two hours later are still watching us you guys that, that really fuels me and I think I can speak for Janice too that says that this is something that we really enjoy 
feeling like your guys are on the journey with us to discuss this and we're able to bring in experts like Craig Foster and, and all the other people that we're going to be bringing in. It's, it's so great to listen to their perspective and to be able to see where they're coming from. And this is why we, um, we're not naysayers. We're not like debunkers necessarily. We want to understand. And to understand, you have to be able to have an honest conversation about it and, and to be able to say, I might be wrong, but let's see the evidence. The burden of proof is on you. When you are making the claim that is such as facilitated communication, facilitated communication, the burden of proof is on them. And this has been something that we've known about for 30, 40 years. And so at certain point, we need to be done with it as we have to be done with this conversation this time. But we will be talking to uh, Brian Gordon. Gorman. On Brian Gorman on Tuesday. Monday. Monday. On Monday. I will be here. Um, or Tuesday. What are these days? Check out Monday. About Time Presents. Monday. <laughs> project. About Time Project. Monday. And he will be talking to us about uh, another area of facilitated communication. And... FC and the Law. FC and the Law. Okay, that's going to be on Monday the 27th at 11 o'clock um, time here. And Janice and I will be continuing until we've run out of everything to say or they finally <laughs> fix this COVID thing that we can go out and be free and go run around where we want to run around. So we're waiting. So thank you so much, Craig, for joining us. I really appreciate it. That was really thank enlightening. You, Craig. So many oh, great thank points. you. It was I think fun. our Wikipedia editors are probably going through going, oh, that's a good quote. Let's use that one on the Wikipedia page. <laughs> so check out our, uh, uh, like us on Facebook, About Time Project, as well as our About Time Project YouTube channel so that you can no, be notified when we upload videos there's a whole playlist that Janice and I have done and this will go on there and thank you guys so much bye all bye thank you guys